Okay, as in go. Sorry, one second. Fork Tales, a podcast that feeds the food and beverage world. Oh, awesome. Fork Tales is brought to you by Vigor, a branding and marketing agency for passion driven, innovative restaurant, beverage, and hospitality brands. Learn more at vigorbranding.com. If you love what we're serving up, please give Fork Tales a five star review on your podcast service of choice. Think of it as a tip for good service. Everyone, today I'm joined by my friend Chef Kenny Gilbert of Silky's Chicken and Champagne Bar and Chef Kenny Brands. Uh, Kenny, why don't you give everyone a little bit of backstory and say hello? Uh, well, thanks for having me. Um, gosh, I've been in the business for the better part of 30 plus years um, professionally. Um, I've run everything from fine dining uh, restaurants to luxury brand, you know, five and five star hotels. Um, you know, I've been a corporate chef for a restaurant group, um, worked in the Caribbean, um, done a little bit of everything. Um, I currently have uh, a restaurant in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, it's called Silky's Chicken and Champagne Bar. Uh, we're located in historic Springfield area of Jacksonville. Uh, we've been open exactly a year. Uh, we're focused on biscuits and fried chicken and champagne and all in between. Um, cool little fast casual kind of an upscale, fast, casual concept, counter service, where best, basically guests can walk in. We don't take reservations. You just walk in, place an order uh, with the cashier. We give you a number. You you know, you get your drink immediately and then sit down and we deliver your food and we're hands off. We've kind of opened this concept based on having, um, you know, with all the everything that's going on with COVID and whatnot uh, and uncertainty, we wanted to have something that was, uh, you know, low overhead um, that still was able to put out a quality product. So, We've been doing that and it's been very well received. And uh, I also have Chef Kenny Brands, um, uh, which we have, uh, there's a lot of different things rolled up into that, but we have, uh, I have my uh, spice blends that I sell on Amazon, um, as well as my website, chefkennygilbert.com. We have five spices that we feature um, and uh, they come with, uh, in the gift set, it comes with recipe cards and a nice little gift box. Um, you can also buy individually uh, and buy bulk um, by way of the website. Um, so I've been doing that for a long time and we're getting ready to launch uh, our so- sauce line as well. That should be coming out by the end of January. And uh, yeah, that's about it. So, so, you're, so you're not busy at all. <laughs> you're, you're, you're just kind of bored. Um, no, that's great. So we'll get into the, the, the retail line in a minute, but I want to dig into first um, the inspiration between combining fried chicken, this like Southern classic staple with champagne, and I presume sparkling wine. I, I presume you're not a champagne purist. Maybe you are though. Yeah. Um, so what's the inspiration behind that? How did that come to be? Is that a, I don't know, a cultural thing or is it just like, hey, I love champagne. I love chicken. They go well together. I mean, because the sweet and the salty do go well together. Yeah, for sure. So um, yeah, we do offer um, uh, sparkling as well. Um, so we're not just exclusive to champagne because I don't think everyone will be able to necessarily afford to do that every day. <laughs> um, but uh, we have we have everything in between. We we highlight champagne cocktails, uh, uh, and uh, ultimately the idea is we. I was featured doing an event down at the South Beach Food and Wine Festival uh, a number of years ago. Um, and their event uh, was a part of a number of events, but the one event that I was a part of was called Chicken Coop. Uh, it was a uh, fried chicken uh, and, uh, you know, and champagne kind of event. Um, so anyone that loves fried chicken, they love champagne, they go well together, you know, the uh, the bubbles and, you know, whether you get a, a, a brute or, or, or a demi sec or, or something like that, it complements the chicken based on spice levels and whatnot. So anyway, I was highlighted there. Uh, we did a really cool um, hot chicken sandwich um, and everyone loved it. I remember my wife saying at the time, she said, oh, we need to bring something like this back to Jacksonville because there's nothing like that. You know, it'd be great to be able to have different versions and different concepts. Um, 
So at the time, we were running modern and traditional southern barbecue, southern and barbecue restaurants, uh, which had fried chicken, which is the reason why we were invited to do that event. Uh, but since I've closed those restaurants, um, when I was anticipating moving to uh, another state and city to open another concept pre-pandemic, um, we were talking about, you know, when I was stuck at the house cooking uh, meals, uh, posting on social media, like, you know, during this crazy time that we were all quarantined uh, for the most part, uh, you know, we, my wife was like, oh, we should probably try to do that concept. And uh, I remember, uh, you know, throughout the throughout the year, you know, I was just doing all this different meals and different things. And then at one point I was doing fried chicken and biscuits. One particular Saturday, we sold like 80 orders. Um, and then what really put the, the icing on the cake was, um, you know, I've done meals, you know, for the holidays, cooking for Oprah Winfrey um, since 2014. And uh, she happened to call me uh, last year um, and was like, hey, Kenny, we were just, you know, wanted to check in and say, hey, see how you're doing and everything. But I need you to settle a bet for me. You know, it was a bet when she actually uh, actually first had my fried chicken and biscuits uh, sandwich. And, yeah. And it happened to be in Maui. We we're cooking for some special VIP guests. And it was the first time that she had had at that point. But she was she there was a bet between her, you know, her and uh, Kirby and Will, uh, Gail's uh, kids. And um, and so I settled the bet. And then when I hung up the phone, I looked I looked at my wife. I said, oh, we're opening a fried chicken and biscuit concert. Yeah, that was, was it. Like- Super <laughs> Sunday. A day so big, we can't legally say the name. To celebrate football's biggest day, a phone marketing group created Spot Bowl, a supersized Super Bowl commercial bowl. Check out the ad lineup and vote for your favorites at spotbowl.com. Like, that was kind of like, check uh, any any kind of doubt of what concept we should be doing. That was that was put in the universe, and so we we uh, confirmed that. So we sat around looking for names, uh, thinking about names for the concept, and you know, so I ended up coming up with Silkies um, because I wanted it kind of uh, just be a vibe. You know, one they're like, oh, this like sounds like a Silky Smooth, but Silky is actually our kind of our mascot. It's a uh, uh, Silky is a Silky is a type of chicken um, that's a native to, to China. It's a black pigment chicken and um, used for a lot of soups and different dishes, and uh, and it's a really beautiful bird, very flamboyant looking, beautiful f- feathers. So yeah, a lot of plumage, very uh, yeah, fluffy. Om- almost looks like a pom pom walking around. <laughs> exactly. So our mask on the wall has like a saying that says "Bring on the bubbly," and um, she has like a, a diamond headset, um, and then kind of like a, a a pearl necklace with a ruby on it. So it was kind of like a whole whole character. So we really wanted to focus in on uh, ladies coming in to, uh, you know, have a girl's night out, um, you know, have some fun or it could be a cool date night um, or, you know, a meeting spot for me, you know, different things. So we wanted to have it where it had a good masculine as well as feminine feel. And so we highlight these, you know, champagne cocktails to complement the uh, the chicken uh, sandwiches that we do. And uh, we came up with some really cool names that 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 we feel like that the ladies said, "Oh wow, that sounds really cool!" Like I would want to have that as a drink, you know? Yeah, the, the vibe to me seems um, <clears throat> like Andre Three Thousand. Sorry, from Atlanta, so you're going to get the Atlanta references. Yeah, um, Andre yeah. Three Thousand from like the uh, that that split album that they did that got so popular. You know, he was yeah. always sort of like dapper and sort of a bit of a dandy look. You know, so it's yeah. almost like bring on the bubbly, sir. Yeah, um, yeah, quite lovely. Sure. So, what is in in your opinion? Well, first of all, the the debt or the bet um, for Oprah was it that you make the best fried chicken sandwich in the world? But what was the bet? Oh, there was the the, the bet was when she actually first consumed the chicken and biscuit because when I one of the first times I made the biscuits, it was uh, um, I, I don't know if it was two thousand sixteen or two thousand seventeen, um, and it was a jalapeno cheddar biscuit. And um, it was it was a part of our um, our uh, New Year's Day uh, brunch. Mm. And and I remember she um, was walking through the buffet and, uh, d- you know, doing her narration, which she usually does for the holidays, you know, that she posts on Instagram. And then she came by and picked up the biscuit and was like, oh, and these jalapeno cheddar biscuits. But not today. And she was like, Weight Watchers love you. And she was like, <laughs> she put it down. 
And she was, uh, you know, she was, you know, during the holidays, she's always, um, you know, enjoys everything, but is always very conscious about, you know, her, you know, what she consumes and whatnot. And I think that time she wanted to uh, do something special because I think that's when she ended up having a speech for the Oscars, um, Mm -hmm. like shortly thereafter. And, uh, and so she was, you know, very, very focused, even more so, um, at that moment, because I think she was getting a lifetime achievement award or something like that right. uh, at the time. So, so um, we'll get into the fried chicken in a minute, but Oprah's not the first celebrity that you've had a brush with. And um, the other one that I'm referencing, well, you you beat him. And that's, that's a very hard thing to do. And that's uh, Mr. Bobby Flay. So you, oh, yeah. you beat him at his own game. Yeah. Uh, for those that don't know, Bobby Flay has a show. It's called Beat Bobby Flay, and uh, chefs compete to um, compete against him. So the first two chefs compete against themselves uh, to get to that stage, and then whoever wins that round goes on to beat Bobby Flay with their own dish. So, um, for instance, you know if you're really good at cooking lasagna, you challenge Bobby to make a lasagna yeah. that's better, and then there's three un- quote unquote unbiased judges that uh, blind taste test and award the winner. And honestly, I think I've maybe seen one episode. Um, I, I don't watch it religiously where someone's won. Um, so that's quite an achievement. I think the win ratio, if I had to guess, is like maybe like 5% of people win. Um, and this is Bobby making stuff that he doesn't normally make. So I've seen exotic things like paella and, and things like that, that he just is out of his comfort zone. So one, what did you challenge him with? And two, how the hell did that feel? <laughs> um i challenged him with um uh, chicken and dumplings mm. um, so i had a version of chicken and dumplings that was you know not super um uh traditional um but it was you know when you get it you know you, it's kind of like that warm hug you get from grandma um yep. when you when you consume it um and it has some other influences into it um you know like i had like pimento cheese nudie uh, were the dumplings that I made, um, you know, I pureed the vegetables in to make the sauce so that it didn't have as much fat in it. Um, and there was a lot of nice roasted vegetables uh, that complement it so that it was this nice soup of dumplings and chicken, but also had nice roasted vegetables with it. So um, very herbaceous. So, yeah, I felt amazing to beat him. Um, he yeah. ended up doing um, something with like a sweet potato spatzel uh, was his version of dumplings. Um and I think that, you know, uh, I think if he had pulled off the, the, the sweet potato um, spatzel properly, um, that he could have had a chance because those are dumplings. Um, right. They had the right sauce ratio. I don't know. I didn't taste it. I didn't really see it. I saw it what everyone else saw like on TV. But, um, you know, that, you know, the fact that he went that route, um, you know, just shows his diversity and, and, and culinary ability. Yeah, he's amazing. I mean, yeah. I, I'd be a little upset that I didn't get to taste it. You know, win, win or lose, I'd be like, no, 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 I want to taste what he made. <laughs> like, yeah, no, the, the, the production is uh, is on a tight <laughs> schedule. That would be a cool part of the show is that you get a chance to taste each other's food. Yeah, um, that'd be a nice little upgrade to the to the show for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Like, because I mean, could you imagine like if you let's say he won and you taste it, and you're like, what? This is garbage. What? Like, you know, like the, yeah, the energy. No, <laughs> you're, you're right. Yeah, hundred um, percent. It's uh, uh, you know, on Top Chef, you know, like you're able to, you know, we were able to taste each other's food. Sometimes, like when the cameras are off, we'll go around and try certain things, or when we're cooking. Uh, you can just tell that someone else had made something really, really uh, special um, that mm-hmm. was uniquely, either uniquely different or it was super, super traditional. Um, you know, but the, the the perception of the of the of the of the judge um, and their palate and what they like to eat, there's there are all those different variables that are in there. Um, uh, you know, if you're cooking for Padma. You know, it's like it better come with a lot of flavor and better be balanced because coming from her her roots, you know, that's how she's used to eating. You know, um, and if she doesn't understand a cuisine or maybe it hasn't had it, then she's going to still look for balance and base it in all those areas, whether she knows about deep rooted southern food or Italian, you know. Right. 
Yeah. So you well, and, it, and yeah. so we had uh, Chef Scott Conant on a, a little bit ago, mm-hmm. and um, that's another example. Like I, you know, I had a little bit of a joke of a question there. Like, talk to me about red onions because notoriously, you know, on Chopped, for instance, you'll see mm-hmm. people take red onions and just put them on top of something. And every time he's like, "What are you doing?" Yeah. You know, like you got to yeah. do something with these because it's too powerful. And um, and then same thing, like if you're cooking for Chef Scott Conant and you're going to bring pasta, you better better bring it. You better bring some really good pasta and don't yeah. mess it up. Yeah, uh, sure. So yeah, you really do have to cook for the chef, uh, for the, uh, the the judges, like you said. So we've just we've just uh, dropped some serious names in the business. I think a big question for up and coming chefs uh, that may be listening is, how how did you get here? How do you get to the point where Oprah Winfrey is calling you on the phone? I mean, she calls me all the time, of course, but, you know, for other people. Um, You know, I think what ends up happening is um, I think it's with the energy you put out in the universe. You know, I really I really believe that. I think that uh, whatever your goals are um, professionally, um, you don't necessarily look for like, oh, I want to cook for these people. I want to do this or that. You look at, hey, I want to be the best I can be in my profession um, and be good at what I do in my wheelhouse. Um, because everyone, every, every, every chef is an artist, you know, it's like rating paintings, you know, from this famous artist to this famous artist, they're different perspectives is who's to say who's a better artist. You know, um, you can say that you like this style versus this style. And I think that for me, the way it started was me and my career going to culinary school, you know, even going back to um, going to home ec in seventh and eighth grade mm-hmm. and having that, that in, you know, instilled in me and then going to every program in high school um, and then getting working for the Ritz Carlton company, you know, learning that. Um, I'm, I'm on a meeting. Um, sorry. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I basically worked, you know, my way up through the Ritz Carlton company worked at a very high level, you know, running five down and four star restaurants uh, for several years, uh, being a very young chef doing it uh, and traveling around the country and around the world uh, gave me exposure. Um, And the Ritz Carlton was a platform for me to start that. So when you're cooking at a high level for the top 5%, you know, top five, 10%, right? It's, it's, um, you know, you're, you're already at a certain point where, you know, you're going to be interacting with certain levels of people. Um, and you're not thinking about it. You're just like, well, I'm just passionately cooking what I want, uh, and what I'm learning about and sharing that. And, and, and then I think the other part of it is, uh, relationships with your, you know, the people that you're meeting around the world. Uh, my friend, um, Sonny Sweetman, you know, right when I became chef in 1996 of the grill room, which is a five diamond four star restaurant at the Ritz Carlton in the Island. Uh, Sonny had moved down from Baltimore. Um, he was becoming the chef of the cafe and they're, they were doing a full remodel. Um, and they reconstituted it called Cafe 4750, uh, where he basically, basically introduced new recipes and concept for this restaurant. Uh, when he first arrived, there weren't any hotel rooms available, um, things like that. And, um, so I basically invited him to my home, basically, you know, let him sleep at my home. I fed him you know, gave him what he needed until he, he was able to get his own place, um, you know, in a hotel room until he was able to move stuff coming down from Boston, whatever. So at the end of the day, we ended up, um, you know, breaking bread and building a relationship. And he, you know, like fast forward to now, you know, over the last several years, he was working out in L.A., you know, working at the Hotel Bel Air. Uh, Ms. Winfrey happened to come in to come uh, have some tea with some some of the girls um, or some of her friends. He ended up making the tea for her. he met he met met her at that point. He mm-hmm. started cooking for her, uh, you know basically at the hotel and whatnot. And then they offered him a job. Once oh, wow. he got that job offer, he then called me and said, "Hey, Kenny, you know you would not believe it. Um, I just took a new job as a private chef for Oprah Winfrey." He's a, I was like, get the hell out of here. <laughs> and he was yeah, like, yeah, yeah, man. And then he said, then he said, uh, um, you know, she likes to have, you know, it's very important for her to have good people around her. And I know we're going to be doing a lot of cool events and I would love for you to be a part of this journey with me. Um, is helping out and do events and stuff like that. Whenever I call upon you or whatever, or I need your help. 
And I said, man, I got you, no problem. And it started like literally doing, I was invited to do a party um, for, uh, I think the, the, her property where she, you know, where she bought a, you know, promised land. She did a, a mm. special 80th birthday party for the, the person she bought the home from. And, um, I was invited to come down to help run the event and execute the event with Sonny and some other chefs. And, um, uh, that's the first time I kind of somewhat met her. Um, that was like the earlier part of 2014. And then I was invited to come out to cook for the holidays for Thanksgiving uh, Christmas and New Year's. And, um, so I did it. And then I cooked for the Selma movie premiere. Um, so like literally within from 2014, I, I literally did, uh, two, like two, like two very high level events. Um, and then I cooked for like three weeks, four weeks for her and her family. Um, yeah. and that led into me yeah, me making the money that I did, um, and then ultimately opening up my first restaurant um, by my, you know, with my wife. So, so that's how nice. I got there. You know, at the end of the day, it's the position you put yourself into where you're working, and then the relationships you build. I mean, I broke bread with a, a, a gentleman back in 1996 that I still remembered. You know, since 2014, like we've always been friends, and he's like, "Man, I, I would love for you to be on this journey with me." So, really, it was through. I really feel like me opening up my heart and my home just naturally, you know, back in 96 that manifested to our relationship over the years. And then I got the opportunity in 2014. I love it. Yeah. It's so, it's so easy to sit back. And um, I think a lot of people do this students, you know, or, or uh, people early on in their careers, they, they see folks like you, they see folks like um, Danny Meyer or uh, n- name the person that is at least, a shooting star or on an upward trajectory. And they say, I want that, yeah. but they don't see all the stuff in between. And I think what's interesting is if you look at trajectory from the side view, and I think that's how most people look at it, you know, it, it starts down and then, and then it shoots up. And sometimes it's a drastic shoot. Sometimes it's a little bit longer, uh, yeah. whatever, but they just see upward momentum. But if, if you take that, that perspective and go over top, and look down on that trajectory, I think what you start to see is more of a zigzag, you know, uh, I'm over here, then I'm here, you know, being open to those opportunities, um, not screwing people over, but knowing when it's time to move on and how to do that in a way that is um, amiable and sets the, you know, the person that gave you that chance that you're walking away from up for success after you. Um, And then, like you said, creating those relationships. And ultimately breaking bread. It's, it's why, you know, I always say life's most memorable moments happen around food and beverage. And that's the whole thing. If you break bread together, there is a, it's an intimate connection in the right ways and you get to really learn someone. Absolutely. Um, you know, and while all this stuff is going on, you're going through life, life challenges, you know, you know, is, it is real. It's, that relationship, maybe, you know, yeah, you know, there was an, a, a, an auto accident, you had to get a new car. Like there's a million things that go under that. Like, it's not like you're just like, okay, I'm a robot. And I'm, I just been doing this for X amount of time. And I just did it perfectly. You're right. It is a zigzag. And, um, and ultimately when you're able to, the, the, me and Sonny, like we still do this to this day. When we first started talking in the office or the office that we shared in that main kitchen, we we talked about food. We talked about life. Um, we talked about you know training and development of our people, wanting to be the best goals that we actually had, and um, and we still have those same conversations. It always is about a great dish or a concept of something. Then it goes into family and what's going on in our in our world. Um, it goes into potential opportunities out there from a product or a brand that we think we can, you know, want to, want to manifest into something special. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it is always end up being like, you know, man, I love you. Thank you very much. And, you know, I'll connect with you in another, you know, in a month or two or something like that, you know, right. and it's like, to, we still been doing that, that same thing since 96. And I do that with other chefs and other friends as well. And that's why, you know, like when someone needs some, something, we know we can call on each other at any given time. And we'll make it happen, whether it be a phone call, whether it be flying out there to do the event or whatever it takes. And, right. Uh, so, yeah, for sure. It's great to find those people that, um, although in a sense you compete because you're, you're in the same industry, but 
I've always been a proponent of a rising tide. You know, you know, you don't need to sink ships to make yours float better. You just need to focus on your ship and then also help others out where you can. Um, so let's move from breaking bread to breaking, uh, baking, uh, breaking biscuits. Um, mm-hmm. So tell me, in your opinion, what makes a top-notch, fantastic fried chicken? And then we'll do the same for biscuits. Like, what is it? Is it the crunch? Is it the the color? Is it you know the type of oil? What are some of the mechanics without giving away Kenny's secret sauce? Um, I think it's, you know, ultimately it's starting off with a good product, you know, it's the chicken itself. Um, and then from there it goes into what, what, are you, what are you trying to achieve out of this chicken? You know, like, are, are you, you know, what is your theme? Is it Korean? Is it classic Southern? Is it double fried crispy? Um, is it, you know, naked, you know, um, is it breaded, you know, what, like, what are you trying to achieve out of it? And then, um, then you maximize in the seasoning and flavor profiles based on that concept. And then, um, you know, I think it's brine, you know, um, it's your philosophy. Are you going to do some kind of brine? Are you going to do just a buttermilk kind of deal? Um, like, or you just putting the seasoning straight on and then dredging it and then frying it. You know, my mom used to take her chicken and wash it in the sink and then season it with lorries and garlic powder and lemon pepper and black pepper, um, onion powder, whatever, let, you know, paprika. And then she would let it, you know, throw a bunch of flour on it and just kind of let it get tacky in the sink. And then she would get her grease and her cast iron skillet going. And then she would throw a little more flour on there because it uh, basically it created a little batter around it. And then that the last little dusting gave it that nice little crunch and she would fry it up, come around of the grease and then let it sit there. And I would eat it super, as soon as it came out of the grease with some hot sauce, you know. And to me, there's there's some people like a lot of breading. Some people like don't. Some people like it spicy. It's like like some people are like original KFC type people and some are Popeye's. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? There's, we'll talk about Popeyes in a second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and then there's and then there's in between. It's like going to get a great Korean fried chicken wing and having that crunch, like like you bit in the glass. You know, it's like, do you like that version? Um, and then you know, or do you like Italian? Do you like a do you like a chicken parm kind of type of fried chicken? I mean, there's a, a you know, so, you know, do you like just panko? You know, like a, like a Japanese style. Like there's. Uh, there's a million ways to skin a cat, you know, so to speak. But yeah, so so for you, is mom's chicken still the best? You know what? She doesn't even fry chicken anymore. She hasn't cooked for me since I was like twelve. So, oh, man. so oh, yeah, what's going yeah, on? no, it's foul. It's foul. Like I can't even. Um, I'm sure if she did, it would be amazing, and I would probably yeah. get emotional. But she literally said, well, that's why you're so good at cooking right now, because I stopped and allow you just to do it. I'm like, yeah, OK. Yeah, that's one way of putting it, Mom. <laughs> yeah, some people call that neglect. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you said Brian and, and I, oh, man, I'm going to I'm going to be raw. I have PTSD from the word Brian. So my wife and I were, were going through a renovation of the house. And so we're packing things up. But that's right around Thanksgiving. And for me, Thanksgiving meal, it's. It's, it's my, it's the one like for me, like I, I, I know that for a fact, I, I had an open heart surgery a few years back. Um, and even though it was a high probability of success, there's still that chance. Right. So mm-hmm. what's my last meal? I'm like, mom, I want, you know, I want Thanksgiving meal. Yeah. You know? And so my, my mom, my wife and I, we, we had that. So that's my meal. I love it. And I, I'm really good at making it. You know, I've gotten really good at it. Mm-hmm. Well, in the rush, uh, Kenny, I made the worst turkey in the world. It was so bad. It, it was inedible. My wife's over there trying to eat it. And I'm like, stop acting like it's good. It's not good. You know, like I'm looking at her no. and she's like, it's not, it's not that bad. I'm like, it's that bad. So I think what had happened is ignorantly, I picked up a brined chicken. I mean, a uh, turkey. And I don't think I knew it. Um, now I didn't rebrine it, but olive oil, salt, pepper. I didn't have a turkey bag. I'm a big fan of turkey bags for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. And it it was like rubber. It was like salted rubber. It was that bad. Anyway, so I don't talk about brining anymore, even though I know it's a good thing to do in a certain style that if you want it. But 
man, I that Brian got me. Um, oh, man. <laughs> it was the saddest thing ever. Um, and then, of course, you know, Christmas, we didn't get the meal because of COVID and everyone got Omicron and blah, blah, blah. So yeah. uh, I think I might have to do a real, like when I get back in my house, hopefully in June, maybe May, hopefully May, my first order of business in my kitchen is to reapproach the Thanksgiving that I messed up oh. and just do it right, you know, right, right. <laughs> come out swinging. Um, so, all right, b- back to you, more importantly. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so you opened Silkies in the pandemic. How, how did it do? I mean, I presume it did okay. Yeah, it didn't. I mean, um, my landlord, um, we really set up a good, um, you know, rent um, kind of, uh, you know, budget and um, plan. So, like, it was both, we're both in a winning situation. Is it percentage based rent? Um, so, if we do well, he does well. You know, the first year, uh, we really, he really put it at a scale that was able to help me, uh, save money, um, to be able to reinvest in the business, um, also be able to save money throughout the year. Um, because we didn't know what was going on. I mean, we, I knew that for, you know, two, three years, if not a little bit longer that we we're going to have, uh, some drop off in terms of business. And, and it's hard enough to find people to come to drive to Springfield anyway, cause it's like an old spot that it was original old school Jacksonville and, one, you know, it's been going through a renovation phase and a lot of beautiful homes are being built here or remodeled. But at one point it was the hood, you know, um, and uh, and now it's it's really a prominent uh, neighborhood. If you love what we served up, please follow us at Vigor Branding on Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Medium. Four Tales is produced by the team at Vigor. Audio and video post productions provided by Zencaster. Music performed by Jet Trash and licensed through MusicBed.com. Joseph handles his own hair, makeup, and stunts. Copyright 2003 to 2021. Vigor Graphic Design LLC. All rights reserved.